nowadays you can find that there's some gaming going on where, oh, let's list all these prestigious things and we'll put some cruft in there too that's paying us. So Google has to up their game in terms of spotting this stuff and finding unnatural patterns and so forth. Mm -hmm. But as the AIs get more and more advanced, they can detect those unnatural patterns, not just in links and not just in content too. Mm -hmm. In just pretty much anything and everything, there's correlation. And, and let's say that you're doing some sketchy link building. Welcome back to seoleverage.com. My name is Gerd Mellack. This is episode 106. And today I'm very pleased and really appreciate you to take the time a real SEO expert, one of the greatest SEO we uh, look up to in this industry and have been for a while, Stefan Spencer. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Kurt. It's uh, great to be here and thank you for the kind words. No, absolutely. I mean, if you're an SEO and you haven't been living under a rock, you probably have heard of your books like The Art of SEO or, or Social E-Commerce or like I heard you speak at some point. We got introduced a few years ago by our common business coach, my mentor, James Remco, which I definitely appreciate. Had some, some touch points there as well. But yeah, you have been on my radar for quite a while, even earlier with your books, obviously with the speaking arrangements and something I definitely want to try to extract some information out of you around. Uh, Cross-channel SEO is not something many people speak about, but I know you have uh, had quite some experience and you definitely have this perspective a little bit beyond what is the narrow focus of SEO and really look a little bit above the fence and see how else can we leverage other channels and see this marketing a little bit more global. Uh, I want to mention I had the pleasure to speak on your Marketing Speak podcast, which came out recently. You're also the host of the Get Yourself Optimized. You're very much in personal development, in academics. You have surrounded by really big names like Jay Abraham, Tony Robbins. So reading your history, I, I'd have, my first question probably would be, how are you able to bring so many things in such a short life? <laughs> I mean, your about <laughs> page really is like, you, you probably don't sleep much more than four hours, do you? No, no, no. I sleep. Uh, last night, I think I got a full eight. <laughs> but so what's you know, your secret? We're actually working while we're sleeping. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, we all work while we're sleeping. We're in the astral realm or doing uh studies or whatever our soul leaves the body and then goes and does stuff so we don't <laughs> actually uh take a break our body might take a break but <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely definitely impressive about page and history yes, but in, in in answer to your question about like how do i get all this stuff done it's really about intentionality mm -hmm. so if i bring a strong intention let's just say i show up for a, a family reunion mm -hmm. uh, there's one every year in michigan that i go to most years Right. If I just showed up, let's say it's a speaking gig or a podcast interview, right? If I just show up without intention, then maybe some good things happen. But if I show up with a powerful intention, let's say to reconnect with somebody in my family at the family reunion that I haven't really spoken to for a while, or maybe somebody I hadn't ever said I love you to because it's just so awkward because they never say I love you to anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If I overcome that discomfort and do the uncomfortable thing, get outside my comfort zone, that's my intention. It's amazing what you can accomplish. It's like the universe conspires to make your dreams come true. You don't have to do all the hard slog, all the Gary V sort of hustling. You can get kind of carried down the river mm -hmm. instead of having to swim it. And that's how you accomplish great things is you just realize and surrender to the co-creation, the collaboration that you have with your creator. Very interesting. Have you always had this intentionality around the things you do? Uh, no, I had to learn some hard lessons. Uh, <laughs> I used to be ag agnostic and things were very hard <laughs> back then. Mm -hmm. There's this quote from Carl Jung that life really begins at the age of 42. Up until then, it's just research. <laughs> and it was age 42, in fact, where I had my spiritual awakening in India, getting touched on the head by a monk. And I know this has nothing to do with SEO, but it does answer your question about intentionality. Getting touched on the head by a monk, getting a oneness blessing, put me into a psychedelic state. I'd never done drugs. I still have never done any drugs. But from my understanding of what a psychedelic state is, everything is kind of like in technicolor, super bright. Uh, like a cartoon. And that was what happened. And I felt this deep sense of peace, connection to the creator. And remember, I was agnostic, didn't believe really in anything other than science. 
had a master's in biochemistry, a real nerd, right? And then boom, I get plugged into the fabric of creation and I feel so peaceful and connected and deeply loved. Then all the miracles started happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just been one after another after another. It's quite magnificent. Wow, sounds sorry definitely... to go off on this tangent, but uh, you know, no, it definitely sounds like a life changing event. I do want to get us a little bit back to our main topic yeah. today SEO, but it's definitely <laughs> nice to have some, some personal background. I know you have been doing quite some personal development as well, obviously, with some with Tony Robbins and the like. So, uh, definitely all fits together. One of the things I want to point out is it's really interesting. You have been working with a lot of big brands. In our case, we're mostly mm -hmm. with like six, seven figure businesses, mostly like e-commerce sites, online courses, coaches. This is probably where we have a little bit more our focus. I know you've been working with a lot of international, multinational brands, eight, nine, 10 figures, probably. What is the difference in challenges for the big companies when it comes to SEO, when compared to a six or seven figure company? Is there anything yeah. in particular so that is very different there? Yeah, it's big. It's big. So let's say with a six or seven or even potentially an eight figure brand or organization, there's nimbleness that you don't have with a billion dollar brand. So a billion dollar brand uh, can be incredibly frustrating to deal with. We even had one that we fired. Uh, it was so untenable. But let's just take an example where let's say that it's a very visual, high end, stylish brand. and mm -hmm. They're very particular about what goes on the website. So it's very visual, not much text. And let's say that the most important pages of the site, things like category pages, homepage, of course, were required to be all visual with no text. Mm -hmm. And that was a guideline from on high. You can't change that. Yeah. So here comes an SEO company, me and my team, trying to optimize a website where the most important pages we can't add any copy to. Mm -hmm. Incredibly frustrating. So I loved being able to have on my portfolio, on my client list, big brands, mm -hmm. but I realized that was ego. And so I've stopped trying to focus on the big household names mm -hmm. and instead focus on companies and organizations that are more nimble, flexible, uh, able to implement the changes that are required and they have an incredible mission that are changing the world, making it a better place, not just providing yet another beautiful thing to wear. It's interesting. I have my own experience with one of those companies, which I think it was more of a technical nature. I think I asked them to create a subdomain or change a subdomain or something like this, something where you would usually, my usual client was probably the owner of this domain. I talked to and they would open up their domain panel and they would walk them through the steps to make this change and in two minutes we would be finished and i was like on this call i said yeah if you can just open or if you have permissions can you just open this panel and and we do this really quickly and i remember the cmo said no 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 this is this is not going to headquarters and they're going to respond in a couple of months right and then they probably is going to send this to our country's headquarters and they also take a, a couple of months and probably around six months or so we could create this subdomain but there is a chance that in five months they tell us they don't want to do this <laughs> it was like the moment where i said okay probably we this is not going to be our best case study just because it's just such a rigid system just for a google ads landing page i think we did on top of, of some seo optimizations but it's just such a rigid system. There was no way to move yeah. anything. It feels like pushing the Titanic as a small agency, even with 30 people, we can't do this. And it was really frustrating. So I absolutely see this point. Another thing we have come up to was really that we would just randomly add or remove stuff we were working. I remember, I think it was Regis years ago, and we had like two countries, then suddenly you get five countries, then suddenly they take this away, then it's centralized, they move things around like in a spreadsheet, and whenever they move something on a spreadsheet, you get a notice on what needs to change. So really hard to maintain like a long-term strategy. Yeah, and circle back to and, and correlate to this question, a question you asked a few minutes ago about uh, cross-channel uh, and integrating different departments or functions, channels together. So with a big company, inevitably it's 
like pulling teeth to try to get that cooperation to happen. They're, they're silos in the organization. So social media is run by a completely different team. They don't talk to each other. They don't coordinate anything. And they probably don't even like each other. <laughs> so it's very frustrating. And uh, on the flip side, if you're working with a small, nimble, hungry uh, company, I love Les Brown's adage, you got to be hungry. I don't know if you know who Les Brown is, but he's a super inspiring uh, a motivational speaker and, and uh, personal development guru. I want to work with companies that are hungry. And if they see there's potential to integrate these two different areas together and gain some, some leverage, because if you have, let's say, a campaign for a book launch that is pretty much focused on social media and you're not taking into account SEO, what if you merge those two initiatives together and you coordinate? And so now you, you didn't have a knowledge panel on Google and now you do because maybe you're not in Wikipedia, but you're in Google book search. And what is the description that's displayed in your knowledge panel was thought about ahead of time by the team that coordinated the book launch. And it was a multifunctional team that included SEO and social media expertise. And then you put out videos that aren't, let's say, just on TikTok, but are on YouTube as well. And YouTube being the number two search engine and a much more important property from an SEO perspective than TikTok, then you're kind of leveraging the opportunity to its fullest potential. Mm. But also bearing in mind that, you know, a lot of these uh, social pushes that you're going to do aren't going to have any real tangible effect on SEO because of the links being no followed from all the social platforms and so forth. So you got to kind of think outside the box. And it's really fun. It's like a puzzle. Trying to figure out how to leverage uh, social platforms that actually yields an SEO benefit. <laughs> Absolutely. And it comes down to this intentionality you mentioned in the, at the beginning again. I remember client calls where usually one of the first things is I ask is how they get clients. And then they would mention their channels and we do some social media, we do some Google ads, we do this, we do that. And usually then I try to get the contact details of the people working on that team just to reach out and say, hey, we do SEO. You're doing Google ads. Is there a chance to exchange some information? We have found some things that convert really well that might be interesting for you. Maybe you can give us some keywords that you know are converting well and we can add this to our research and to our process. And then you just see the real difference where you say, okay, there's one company that also wants this SEO project, but they just only got Google ads. So they're like kind of trying to, to not share too much. And then you have other projects where it's like a dream working on this. You get together on a Zoom call, every, have a good time. Everybody has the intention to get the best results for this client it's really a dream working on those projects i love those projects where just say okay hey i found something that converts really well don't you want to do something on social media about the same angle because this seems to be resonating right or the, the youtube uh, person comes back and says hey we just had a, like a video go viral let's take some keywords that could be interesting and everybody just trying to to get the best results is really amazing what would be a use case where you would say social media could benefit seo for example. So let's go back to the case of a book launch. So I'm going to take a uh, page out of Justin Bieber's playbook. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. Okay. He's actually a very smart marketer. What he did back in the day to uh, promote, launch a song called What Do You Mean? I don't know if you know that song, but uh, it was quite popular. It broke some records, in fact, like that hadn't been broken since the Beatles. So what he did was he coordinated with a bunch of influencers, mm -hmm. a bunch of his friends who are famous uh, celebrities, people like Ellen DeGeneres, famous singers, Ed Sheeran. So amazing, amazing celebrities. And each day for 30 days, he had at least one major celebrity do a countdown, put a post on social with uh, them holding a piece of paper that said, day 30 or day 28 or day 26 or day 15 or whatever, all the way to day one and day zero then, which was the launch date of the song with the hashtag of what do you mean? So it actually said on the piece of paper, day 30, hashtag, what do you mean? And let's say Ed Sheeran actually did a little bit of a song that sounded like, what do you mean? It actually didn't sound anything like the actual song, but he used a little bit of the lyrics or something. So that was intriguing to people. You know, let's say it was Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or somebody 
would do some funny looking photo. So just a still image holding the piece of paper or something. And it created quite a stir. Mm -hmm. So how does that spill over to SEO? Well, what if you got these folks to have such huge followings on social media, many of whom probably have a pretty authoritative website, give them something that makes it enticing for them to post it to their blog as well. Mm -hmm. So not just an embed of whatever they came up with to, for Instagram or YouTube or whatever, but gamify so that maybe it's a fun puzzle or mm -hmm. a trivia question or interactive game or something that they can then post. You gotta give them a reason. Justin Bieber did not do this. He only did the social media social portion, part. which was <laughs> phenomenal. I mean, literally he broke records doing this. But if he were to have put something together that addressed people's, uh, the, the celebrities' desire to look magnanimous or just awesome to their fan base on the website as well, well, then that would link back to Justin Bieber's site because whatever he put together would also link back and then he'd get all this authority for Google. So that's just that's something kind of off the top of my head that you know, got to really think strategically and outside the box because uh, that's where all the juice is. You know, tactics are great. They're very helpful. I use tactics all the time, but strategy can leapfrog those tactics. And a great quote, my favorite quote from The Art of War by Sun Tzu is, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So trying to figure out some tactical way to link up social media and SEO, I think that's kind of a waste of time. It might move the needle a little bit, but to figure out a strategy like the one I just outlined, that could be a game changer. Absolutely. It's just big leverage as well for a long time. Even afterwards, people talking about this campaign might still might still link to this, might still uh, give this a little bit of a of a boost months or even years afterwards very often in these kinds of things. So I really like the strategic thinking here behind it. I know also I've heard uh, guys using social ads, for example, for link building purposes, where I just like give a lot of visibility to a certain post or a certain tip or something like this. And then tie this together with actually the end outcome nobody talks about is that there are going to be a lot of links happening because like you do say they have like some sort of a strategy where then everybody puts this on their blog or even normal smaller influencer campaigns where there's a blog component where influencers might charge you a little bit more to also put this on their blog but ultimately this can actually be much more beneficial long term than probably the actual campaign with some stories or so right yeah, the thing that I don't love is when it's like this uh, a kind of circular linking pattern that looks totally engineered. It doesn't look like it was earned by merit, whereas in the hypothetical scenario I gave with Justin Bieber, it would be very viral looking and natural for all those big celebrities to link to Justin. But if it's like, okay, I'm going to link to this person who's also in my in, in this little wheel of promotion or whatever, and then they're going to link to the next person, they're going to link to the next person, and it's all going to circle back and we're all going to link out and uh, give each other some juice, well, Google can easily see the pattern in that. Mm -hmm. Do you remember uh, from Seinfeld, Soup Nazi? Remember that uh, skit? Okay. So there's famous skit, and uh, Soup Nazi was famous for saying to Seinfeld or to anybody that he didn't like, no soup for you. And then he'd make them leave his restaurant. <laughs> and so that's like Google saying no link for you or no juice for you, right? Yeah, so you got the you, links yeah. and you think it's working, but Google's quietly saying to themselves and, and the algorithms, no juice for you. Absolutely. It's interesting how Google these days doesn't even care about penalizing too much anymore. It's been a while, I'm not sure about you, it's been a while since I have seen something that was obviously penalized by Google, like a, like a manual penalty issued. It seems like Google just demotes, just completely ignores. I can say, okay, they can do their thing, they can do their scheme. I just don't take it into account and that's it. Well, I think there's more to it than that. Personally, I would guess that it's not so obvious, but it's essentially a penalty. When you have such sophisticated AI-based algorithms that, that the programmers don't even know what the uh, criteria are that the algorithm is using to base its decisions on, like, how do they even know when a penalty right. or algorithmic adjustment's even happening? Mm -hmm. you know, it's like uh, the EEAT, right? So it's two E's now in EAT. And if you're trying to build that expertise and authoritativeness and all that, 
and convince uh, Google of that. It's not in convincing the human reviewers, those manual raters anymore. That was just training data. Now there's enough training data for the AI to take it from there and make all these humans who are using those guidelines to try and rate your site irrelevant. I don't even know if they bother to spend much time or money with that team of human uh, reviewers anymore because there's plenty of training data now that they've accumulated over the years from having that army of uh, manual raiders. So true. We had just had on the episode 96, I was speaking to Jonathan Gillam from Originality AI. So they have an AI detection okay. tool. And it was really fascinating for me because I, I knew some detection tools like that predict always the next word. Is this like the most likely word coming from a language model perspective? And he was like, yeah, the, the tool pretty much was trained with natural text and trained with AI text. And at some point the tool figures it out. They really don't know how it does it, but it's like really the tool just does its job and it does a good job apparently. And they get to 94, 95 percent accuracy which is, is really impressive but it's like this world now apparently where there's a lot of stuff happening nobody has an idea what actually is happening but then ultimately those algorithms make life-changing or really impact business changing decisions for us right in this industry obviously also for a while i have lost count of how often people talked about link building is going to go away and links are not going to matter and google obviously was trying really hard to figure it out without links my feeling is that the more ai comes to the front line, links are getting more important again. What do you think about that? I would agree. And the reason why I think that makes sense is because the origins of links as votes is citation analysis, which happens in academic journals. The more prestigious articles, the ones that are the more milestones or leaps and advances in science, have mentions in other prestigious articles mm -hmm. and, and journals about them. And they also mention in their references very prestigious articles. There's no cruft making it into uh, their references. And conversely, you find another article that references this one. Usually there's not any cruft in that either. Now, this is within peer-reviewed journal articles back in the day before... Google, and that's very brilliant innovation that came into the search engine uh, world. Nowadays, you can find that there's some gaming going on where, oh, let's list all these prestigious things and we'll put some cruft in there too that's paying us. So Google has to up their game in terms of spotting this stuff and finding unnatural patterns and so forth. Mm -hmm. But as the AIs get more and more advanced, they can detect those unnatural patterns, not just in links and not just in content too, mm -hmm. in just pretty much anything and everything. There's correlation and, and let's say that you're doing some sketchy link building, but you think that uh, you're going to get away with it because you could just say, well, that was my competitor. But then you did some sketchy stuff a few years ago uh, on page. Well, that on page stuff will come back to bite you now, <laughs> even though you got away with it back then because it painted a picture now with the AI as this is a sketchy guy or gal doing unnatural stuff, the link building is probably their thing too because of the on-page stuff. They clearly didn't get hacked mm -hmm. to do this uh, right. uh, sketchy on-page stuff. So now they're doing a sketchy off-page stuff and it's them. It's almost certainly them and the algorithm is going to be right. Absolutely. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Where do you think AI is going to go? We now have a, in the middle of when we record this now, end of January 2023, we have a big boom, chat GPT, even people who have never been really technical are starting to play with it, starting to write posts about it with it, articles, etc. What's your view? I mean, this is moving really fast. I was just reading an article okay. from OpenAI about GPT-4. It's going to be lots of expectations around it to talk about video being AI generated very soon as well. How do you think Google is going to react when content creation is so commoditized that it really doesn't take skill anymore to put together a 500 article page about whatever industry you want. I think the AI at Google is going to get incredibly good at spotting AI generated content because what's missing from an AI generated article is soul. Yeah, there's fact checking and there's stuff that's not relevant. Like I, I was using uh, chat GPT 
to, just as a test, to create a bunch of um, article titles and descriptions. And there was stuff in there about Penguin and like, what the heck? You have to stay current on uh, SEO algorithms like Penguin, et cetera. And no, <laughs> that's, that's pretty terrible. And so somebody needs to fact check all this content mm -hmm. if they're going to have uh, chat GPT generate their articles for them. But further from that, it's like, imagine if you're very intuitive and you're very creative, you're tapped in, you're tuned in, you're, you're turned on to the magic, the, you're plugged into the, to the matrix in, in a good way, into the fabric of creation. So you're like this dumb terminal plugged into the supercomputer. It's like a universal Google, but it's universal intelligence. Mm -hmm. And imagine what you can create from that. Do you know that the, the book by uh, Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, was written in 12 days? Amazing book. 12 days. He just downloaded it from the universal intelligence, the bigger, better cloud. Mm -hmm. And it sold 150 million copies. I'm sure you can find plenty of other kinds of examples like that. How is an AI going to achieve that? Right. It can't. Because what it does is, is it doesn't stand on the shoulders of giants. It steals from the shoulders of giants mm -hmm. or from the giants. So there's no credit to all the originators that the AI model is based on, mm -hmm. right? So you ask it for this uh, artwork in an impressionist style, blah, 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 and it does the thing and it looks amazing. Mm -hmm. Where's the credit to Matisse or to whoever the originators that the algorithm based your image on? Mm -hmm. So would you, there. Yeah. would you expect some regulation there or would you expect just to for the for uh, platforms to be no. smart enough to not give it visibility? I would expect that chat GPT and similar tools will get away with this, but it has karmic repercussions. When you steal without giving credit, karma comes to bite you in the butt. So... I'm contemplating maybe starting a campaign like a hashtag chat GPT is theft because <laughs> <laughs> it is. It would definitely I mean, maybe have, you can yeah. get away with writing, a, maybe having it come up with article ideas. But once you have it writing the article titles and then the articles themselves, like it's a slippery slope. Where does the inspiration end and the theft begin? I remember I, I had a discussion with, Dixon Jones here from InLinks, and I think he said something like we are dumbing down the internet because it's going to be AI copying from AI at some point. So there's mm -hmm. no innovation anymore, no, nothing new, nobody thinking really things through and or, or presenting a different angle, which obviously has yeah. its point there. Then others say, obviously, it's an efficiency tool. You can rather than sitting down and creating a hundred article titles to pick the best one, you can read the 100 article titles, pick the best one. So I'm really curious what Google is going to do. What I expect, or what I tell people I expect is some sort of integration in Google Search Console, probably maybe issue some warnings like they do with, co with Core Web Vitals and with links and everything that has come up that was like altering the overall scheme a little bit. Google eventually then had like some sort of warning issued and demoting and things like those. I am interested mm -hmm. because it's really... I guess they need to define some sort of threshold. I mean, it's going to be the AI defining the threshold. They're not going to say it's kind of 30% is okay, 31% is not okay. But it, there must be some sort of, of threshold, I guess, oh. where, they, where they still allow some efficiency and say, okay, it's more efficient to do it this way, but we still need to balance it out a little bit. But I think you're still thinking like a, a computer program that someone would have written rather than a generative AI figuring this out like take one very sophisticated ai that we can't figure out w what its attributes are and what the the thresholds are that if we cross we we get the big red x mm -hmm. we're not going to know we're going to try and reverse engineer it but will we succeed at it? i don't know and i don't think it's in google's best interest to share that threshold with anyone in uh, Google Search Console or anyone else, anywhere else. Have you heard of dead internet theory? No. 
So if you Google it, you'll find that there's a lot of information about it online. And the concept is this, that it's credited to conspiracy theorists, but there's a lot of truth in this. And it, if it's not true now, I have a feeling it will be true later. And that is that most of the internet is fake, written by bots for bots. All these social media posts and so forth that uh, they're clamoring for change. And, you know, there's like a lot of it's fake. Yeah. A lot of it's fake. And we are getting fooled. We're getting swayed by it. Popular opinion is, is swayed by fake content, mm -hmm. fake outrage, fake travesty and tragedy and so forth. It's all fake. So much is fake and we don't know what and, and to what degree. Mm -hmm. But I have this sneaking suspicion it's going to get a lot worse as tools like chat GPT really hit the mainstream and more and more people realize that, oh, I don't have to toil for six months or six years writing a book. I can create it in you know five minutes. Give uh, chat GPT a storyline as a prompt and uh, let it write 50,000 words for me. Yeah, this gets even, even worse, I think, especially when you think, okay, most of what we see is probably uh, skewed somehow. Uh, when you then see the movements in social media networks in the last couple of years where they actually feed you more of what you already think anyway and already like and already engage with. So they just feed you more and you get more confirmation about whatever you think is probably wrong anyway and not based on facts. It's going to be an interesting scenario. So I still, yeah, I do believe there's going to, platforms are definitely going to figure it out. I guess Facebook at some point will probably, for example, base it on whatever they want to push what they allow, what they don't allow. Reminds me of another theory that I've heard that people, as we don't read anymore, we're just guided by the headlines. I'm not sure where this mm -hmm. come from. I would love to credit this to somehow someone where they say, okay, read all the news, everything we think we know is based on headlines because we have never read the entire article. So you're just based on the headlines you get, based on the headlines you have like some certain, certain emotions that affect your values, your beliefs. And this is pretty much what you think you know and, and nobody actually cared enough to read the entire article. It's definitely, yeah. It's another rabbit hole. Uh, I want to just wrap this up a little bit. It's a really interesting discussion here. I want to wrap this up a little bit and really talk about some strategies our listener could take away from your experience, really coming back a little bit to content creation. Say a seven, six, seven figure company, online course creates a piece of content. What would you say should they take into account in order to make this article really First of all, obviously resonate with the users. Ultimately, pretty much everybody we talk to wants to drive conversions, but also stand a good chance to rank on Google and actually get the links necessary to be backed up and, and stand there as a good piece of content. Well, great question. Uh, this is a little bit of a complex answer. I think simple, but there are a lot of kind of parts to this. So first part is you're writing for three audiences. You're writing for the Linkerati, those influencers who have a lot of authority, trust, importance in the eyes of Google. You're writing for your core audience, that ideal client avatar, and you're writing for search. You're writing for Google. You're writing for rankings. These can compete with each other. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I want to have a keyword rich headline for that third audience, but that's probably going to take away from the curiosity gap that I'm trying to create for the Linkerati. I'm trying to bait the linkerati. Oh, I got to click. You know, it's kind of like clickbait, but it's link bait. So by putting all these keyword rich phrases in there, it waters down that ability to be really punchy and create that curiosity gap. Mm -hmm. A curiosity gap is where somebody looks at the headline or the title of the article, let's say in a Google search or in a social media feed, and they just can't help themselves. They have to click on it. And then you don't give away the punchline straight away. You kind of give it to them bit by bit, right? You don't want to um, show your cards too quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's a style of writing that is not easy to accomplish. You have to do that with intentionality. And then on the other hand, that audience that you're trying to reach of the algorithm at Google with let's lead with the most important keyword in the title. And then let's make sure we mention that keyword in the first paragraph and uh, maybe a couple times in the first paragraph, at least one other time in the next two, three or four paragraphs, mm -hmm. these two strategies do not normally intersect. 
And somebody writing for SEO copy is usually not trained on how to write link bait or stuff that's going to appeal to the linkerati and vice versa. And then you've got that audience, the second one, that's the most crucial to the business. And that's the ideal client avatar. Because if you're posting something to your blog and it's just link baity and it's not really talking to their core audience, then it's a big mess. It looks like you're talking at your ideal client and not to them. So how do you accomplish all that? Well, you probably can't accomplish all of it in one article. Right. You probably need to have a plethora of articles, some of which can have some overlap in, in, in targeting uh, between those three audiences. Mm -hmm. Rarely, sometimes you can target all three very effectively, but in most cases, it's just one or two. So you can't just say, I'm going to post two times a week because what's that to post threshold addressing? Who is it addressing and what problem is it trying to solve? So this is uh, difficult stuff. So one thing I, I recommend as a process is think of this as a, uh, a funnel or a multi-phase process where you're starting with the topic. And then you're going to the headline, the title of the article. Maybe you're going to have uh, some provocative adjectives or adverbs to further sexy up the topic, the, the main keyword you're targeting. And now that you've got the title, you can come up with some bullets, like an outline for the article. And maybe you'll also come up with a few viral type images, some memes or things like that. So let's say the topic is kitchen sink. Well, then you're going to do a Google image search for funny kitchen sink and Google image search mm -hmm. or kitchen sink meme in Google image search and see which ones you can use from a copyright standpoint, fair use and all that in creative commons, you got to take all that into account. And so which ones can you use and which ones can't you? So now you've got a really good brief, a writer's brief that you can give to a writer. And where's the AI fit into all this? Maybe in the first part where you're trying to figure out the topic. Yeah, you can definitely ask ChatGPT to sexy up the article and get like additional variations here. Yes, but then again, I feel that that's a slippery slope. Once you get article titles from ChatGPT, what's stopping you from getting uh, subheadlines and what about captions to go under the images that you found on pexels or unsplash etc mm -hmm. etc et and it's a slippery slope and it's it's all theft <laughs> in it's my view theft. it's all theft what is in yeah. your opinion quantity versus quality comes in when it comes to content creation imagine a new site starts out they want to do seo how do you balance out quantity versus quality in blog articles it really is all quality quantity i think is it's a mirage like in, in the desert. So if you're like trying to hit three articles a week and you're not really going for the quality, and what is quality? It, it's something that's remarkable. And I'm going to use Seth Godin's definition of remarkable, worthy of remark. That's from his book, Purple Cow. If it's not worthy of remark, it doesn't matter if it's two articles or 200 articles a week. You're going to get trampled. Chat GPT will eat your, your lunch. So how are you going to tap into that universal intelligence, the universal Google up there <laughs> to come up with such incredible, insightful, helpful, thought provoking, maybe controversial, maybe hilarious article ideas and topics and headlines and so forth that you can then really serve an audience with. And remember that audience isn't just your core audience. It's the linkerati too. And that's the audience that's usually forgotten with all this article writing. I also wonder with all this, if we as readers are going to get better at identifying what has this soul that you, that you mentioned initially, I say AI content doesn't have a soul. Maybe we get a little bit better as well. And just based on our signals, we give Google what we like, what we don't like. This also helps feed this back a little bit to also yes, have like an I, additional I, layer of a filter. I do believe that. I think. I'm experiencing that myself personally. I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, but when I'm on Facebook, the stuff that I get in my feed, you know, talk about a positive filter bubble. <laughs> I get the most awesome content in my Facebook feed. And the danger for me is I get sucked in to love and light, awesome, amazing stuff that's very inspiring and beautiful. 
And then I blow my day away. I'm like, I had big plans for today and I just spent two hours on Facebook. What did I even do? Mm -hmm. So that's why I deleted Facebook from my phone. Basically have an unspoken, unwritten rule for myself that I'm not going to go on Facebook uh, on my laptop either, except maybe a few times a week. It's so good for me. It's great for my productivity and... You know, I could buy into the myth of FOMO, you know, you know what FOMO stands for, right? Mm-hmm. Fear of missing, Fear of missing out. out there. But you know what? On a spiritual level, I learned this from one of my Kabbalah teachers is FOMO is a sign to turn and run the other direction because mm-hmm. that's part of the illusion. Something is off if you think that every minute you're not doing X, Y, Z, you're missing out on something. Something's probably off, right? Yeah. And it, FOMO, it, like the things that you're meant to experience and to be in your life, like you're meant to meet your soulmate, you're meant to uh, meet your next business partner and so forth. Those things happen. They're waiting in the wings like a, a supporting actor at the edge of the a screen on the stage, waiting to make his or her entrance. Mm-hmm. It's not random chance. It's not like, oh, I just happened to miss the train and now I met my soulmate. Wow. Imagine what would have happened if I hadn't missed the train. That wasn't going to happen. You had to miss the train. That's the only answer. So yeah, if you live life like that, everything becomes magic. Absolutely. Very <laughs> inspiring talk today with Stefan Spencer here and very different from usual episodes. I appreciate it. I want to be <laughs> respectful of your time. I appreciate that you're, you gave us so much of your, of your busy day here. Where can people go if they want to find out more about you? Well, my main site is stephanspencer.com. I have the two podcasts that you mentioned already, mm-hmm. Marketing Speak which is at marketingspeak.com and get yourself optimized, which sounds like an SEO podcast, but it's not <laughs> it's all about personal development, spirituality, biohacking, all yeah, that. Definitely and good, that, good that, one for a run. <laughs> My experience. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, for workout or for mm. uh, a long drive and that's get yourself optimized.com. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much. Stefan Spencer, ladies and gentlemen here. <laughs> We have episode 106. We're going to have a written summary and all links over at seoleverage.com forward slash podcast 106. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's been a pleasure to catch up again. And I hope we can do something like this soon again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt.